Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution, which is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. All the more necessary every day in these troubled times. Uh, but there are no troubled times at the National Constitution Center because, uh, first of all, we're about to treat you to a spectacular program with America's leading experts about policing and one of the most uh, thoughtful leaders in the policing field, which is Chief Charles Ramsey, and it's going to be a spectacular discussion. But before I introduce them, I've got to plug our wonderful spring and summer town, uh, town hall program. Pick it up outside. Look at this amazing brochure. The highlights are just so exciting. If you start at the end, you see the National Constitution Center on the road. On April 25th in DC, we're launching our Senatorial Honorary Visiting Scholars Program. And Chris Coons of Delaware and Mike Lee of Utah are going to join together for a program where they're going to have constitutional debates in Washington. And eventually, they hope to have those same debates on the floor of the United States Senate. How exciting to bring these two people together. And we're going to have R's and D's from the House and the Senate debating the Constitution. We're going on the road with a debate on affirmative action in Dallas. We're debating whether Americans have a right to die in New York. And then here in Philly, it's just a constitutional feast starting on April 4th, Jacob Weisberg next Monday on President Reagan. Uh, and then you can just enjoy these highlights yourself. But we're debating the constitutional legacy of Justice Scalia, a wonderful program launching our celebration of the 150th anniversary of the 14th Amendment. Uh, a panel on the next Supreme Court confirmation battle, culminating on June 1st in the thrilling launch of that riveting new book, Louis D. Brandeis, American Prophet, <laughs> by yours truly, but much more interestingly, we've got two of the greatest Brandeis biographers uh, alive who will be joining me, Flip Strum and Mel Urofsky. Please join on June 1st. Okay, so pick up the program. Uh, who's a member? Who's here? Almost everyone is. Anyone who's not, make sure you see Rebecca on the way out and sign up for our great programs. And yes, ma'am. Oh. <laughs> yes. When are they doing that? I got to raise a little money first. And then we've got to get six really strong guys. <laughs> you know where it is? It's on the back of the steps in the art museum. And the art museum is redesigning its plaza. And the head of the art museum, Gail Herity, and I have agreed in principle that it would be a wonderful thing to move that statue of John Marshall at such Philadelphia roots at Valley Forge here to the Constitution Center. We've got a, have a few approvals from the city. We've got to raise some money. But the John Marshall Society is on board. And I hope that we're going to be able to do it. It'll be very, very exciting. If, of course, if anyone wants to have it be the uh, 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 Joe or Jane X Memorial John Marshall statue, then please come see me after the show. That would be great. OK, um, I'm not going to uh, give long introductions, because these are America's leading experts on policing. Uh, please join me in welcoming Barry Friedman, Tracy Mears, and Chief Charles Ramsey. Good job. Good job. <laughs> I have to confess that we've seen a lot of each other today <laughs> because there's a wonderful initiative that the American Law Institute is doing to rethink the future of policing. And all of us have the honor of being on this great committee, and we're trying to think through issues ranging from the future of policing and technology and the use of body cams to the appropriate circumstances for the use of force. And it's a five-year project. Barry Friedman from NYU Law School is leading it up. Uh, Tracy Mears from Yale Law School is an associate reporter, as am I. The chief is an advisor to this great committee. And we, from starting at 9 AM, we've just been thinking through the naughtiest questions involving the future of policing. So what I want to use this conversation to do is to share with you some of those issues so you can have a sense of the deep and rich series of choices that we as a nation confront. But I want to begin with a really inspiring program that the chief has launched, because I think it's one of the most important things that the National Constitution Center is now doing. He has started a program, this great visionary chief, uh, about uh, pl uh, the future of policing, policing in the community. And he's bringing police recruits from Philadelphia, from Camden, New Jersey, and I think the Camden chief may be here 
as well as from Newport uh, News, Virginia, uh, to the Constitution Center to learn about the history of the Constitution, the First and Fourteenth Amendments, about the evolution of the police's relationship with the community over time, and also to talk to school kids at Constitution High about how the police and the community should interact. So this is a magnificent program for constitutional education for officers. Chief, I want you to tell us more about this program. Why did you start it, and what do you hope to achieve with it? Well, thank you very much, uh, Jeff, and thank you for hosting this conversation here at the uh, National Constitution Center, a place where I've, uh, in the past couple of years, spent a great deal of, uh, of time. Uh, this is a Philadelphia treasure. Well, it's an American treasure, not just a Philadelphia treasure, and this is the appropriate uh, venue to have this kind of conversation. You know, um, it, I was police commissioner here for, uh, for eight years and drove by the Constitution Center, I can't tell you how many times. And every time I drove by, I said, I gotta stop in there and take a look and see what it is they do. Do they have an educational program uh, as part of the, uh, of the center? And I just didn't do it. And one day I made comment and um, my lieutenant happened to be with me. Well, he called up and made an appointment. <laughs> and so uh, I actually came by and I saw Kerry Sautner, who is hiding in the back there. And, um, and it, we had a conversation because I wanted to know, I know they had, you have exhibits that kind of come and go different periods of time, but you have a permanent exhibit and there is an educational component to it. And at the time, obviously, um, policing, we have a lot of issues going on right now. And a lot of it has to do with relationships, particularly in um, communities of color, African American and Latino uh, communities primarily. And why is there so much tension? And you know, uh, chiefs across the country have trying to put together different programs, fair and impartial policing, procedural justice, all kinds of programs to try to address it. But I think what's missing is a real understanding of why that tension exists in some communities versus the others. So when I came here and I had a conversation with Carrie and we talked about, and I actually, she took me through the entire museum. And it, it, it's about the history or the evolution of democracy from the Declaration of Independence to the current day. And as I went through the exhibits, I thought, what if we took that same snapshot in time about what policing would have been like now, you wouldn't have had organized police forces in 1776. You had constables and you had different things, but you didn't have organized departments until later. But you had people performing functions that one would say would be pretty close to security or police. So if you were maybe in Boston, yeah, you were you know, making sure that people were safe and you know, checking doors after, after dark and things like that. But if you were in the South, maybe you were also tracking down slaves and engaging in those kinds of activities. You'd have been what we'd consider private security, but security nonetheless. Fast forward that to the exhibit uh, that shows the Civil Rights era and um, the Civil Rights marchers going across the Pettus Bridge. Well, who was waiting on the other side of the bridge? Police. And so when you look at the history of policing in the United States, We've not always stood on the right side of justice as we would define justice today. And I think that's an important point because we're not trying to make bad guys out of folks and whatever. I mean, everything has evolved over time. Our democracy is certainly not the same as it was when, uh, when it first began. Policing is not like it was um, when it first began. We're all continuing to move and, and to evolve. And I think what that does is it helps police officers better understand why that tension exists. Why is there so mistrust? Uh, there are people still living that went through that era. I'm one of them. I wasn't one of the people who was, who was marching and so forth, but I lived through that, that era. I was in Atlanta uh, two weeks ago, and I had an opportunity to visit the Human Rights, Civil Rights Museum there. A great, if you've never been there, you got to go in. But it, again, the history lesson there is incredibly important. And if we can put this into some kind of context to kind of have a better understanding, then I think we're in a better position to move forward and to really understand the importance of building bridges and maintaining those bridges uh, with the communities. Understanding it's gonna take time, understanding there's mistrust, understanding that there's baggage, 
all those kinds of things. Because the cops that are coming on today have no clue as to what happened during that period of time. I mean, it's like all of us. We're kind of in our own little time warp. Whatever we experience during our lifetimes is what we relate to. The rest of it is just history. But we learn from history. And history, if it's taught, can keep us from repeating the mistakes of the past. And that was really why I wanted to do that, similar to something that we did in uh, D.C. when I was chief there with the United States Holocaust Museum, which is another program that I think is pretty, uh, pretty important. Well, that is superb. And this is such an important program, I want to take advantage of this incredible brain trust that we have here and ask Tracy, you know, you're the, one of the leading scholars of uh, policing. You found that people obey the law when they trust the legitimacy of the officers who are enforcing it. If you were advising the chief, as you now are, because I'm asking you to, about what to teach the recruits about the Constitution and about the history of policing, what would it be? Well, I think one way to understand that is just to build on what Commissioner Ramsey just said. I get to call him stuff, but in front of everybody, I'm going to call him Chief Commissioner. No, I'm, I'm retired, so it's just <laughs> Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> Title's gone. Um, so this idea of how people understand the legitimacy of legal authority is, is an interesting one, and it's very tied into um, how the legal agents understand their own history, but also how the public understands it. And we know from research that four things matter a lot uh, when people are making judgments about the fairness of legal authorities. One, they really care very deeply about being treated, the public does, about being treated with dignity and respect. Second, they care a great deal about understanding that decisions that are made um, in their you know, in interactions, but also as a policy matter, are fair, um, and usually what that means is that the decision-making process is transparent and neutral and based in fact. Third, people care a lot about having either input into a policy or in a particular interaction. Um, they want to tell their side of the story, which is what we call voice. And fourth, and this is where I think the history piece really ties in, is um, that people are uh, want to believe that they can be treated benevolently in the future by a person of legal authority. And the research we call that motive-based trust. And one of the ways in which that plays out is that this history piece becomes really important because unless um, agencies, individuals in legal authority positions, are in a position to acknowledge wrongdoing and you know, discrimination and the like. You know, the fact that um, in certain areas of this country, policing actually had its origins in slave patrols. Um, it's very difficult um, to break that lack of expectation that you will be treated benevolently because the way in which groups understand their relationship uh, to I'm using legal authorities as my general category, but I can just say police, since that's what we're talking about. Um, often is generational. It doesn't just have to do with how you yourself were treated by the police, or even your family, but how people who are in your group were treated before you over time. And so that kind of acknowledgement and understanding is important, not only for the law enforcement agents who are doing their jobs, so that they can understand those perceptions Sorry, I should, I should tell everyone, but yeah. we're, we're getting new mics as well, because I know they're not <laughs> I'm ideal, just going to hold this that, for a second. That would be great if you don't mind. Yeah. It'll be, you can um, so, so that they can understand why people have the kinds of perceptions that they do. But it's also important for the public, actually, to have a better understanding of that history so that they can understand where their distrust comes from and so that they can see the important change um, that that Chuck just mentioned, right? Because policing has changed and evolved. Wow, okay, so Barry, you've heard Tracy and the chief, and you're also one of the leading scholars of this history. You're sitting down with the officers. How do you tell this, the history that Tracy has just mentioned, especially in a post-Ferguson world, and do it in a way that allows the police to own the history, but also to regain the trust of the community? So, you know, I would probably jump into a different historical moment in policing uh, and another one that we tend to forget, and it's about 100 years ago, but, you know, the commissioner's right. We, when the country got started, we didn't have police forces as we know them today. 
That was a phenomenon from the 19th century. We created police forces following a model from the UK, 1829, Sir Robert Beale. That's why London's police are called Bobbies, named after him. Uh, and policing got started, and it ran into a problem, which is that police departments became too close to the political management of the cities. We had big city machines, and the police often were hired through patronage jobs, and many folks were on the take and fed that into the machine. And we had a real problem in corruption in many of the major cities in this country. And the solution that we adopted was to separate policing from popular control as much as possible. And it was, it was a wise decision at the time. It needed to happen to create credibility and trust in the police departments. But from that moment forward, what we've done is disengage policing from democracy much more than any other part of government. And what we need to learn to do, and I, I play two roles here, as you're right, I'm the reporter for this American Law Institute project, and I'm the director of a policing project at NYU, and it's all about trying to work to foster community engagement with the police around matters of policy involving policing. I mean, one thing that hasn't come up this evening particularly, though we have two members of the task force here, is that President Obama, after Ferguson, appointed a task force on 21st century policing. And that task force went around the country and heard from people. And one of its repeated recommendations was that we need more engagement between the population and the police about questions of what are policing priorities, how should communities be policed when new technology is rolled out, uh, how should it be rolled out, what are the policies. And that's the right recommendation, but we don't have a history, a recent history, of doing that. And so one of the things we need to do is invent models of the communities engaging with their police departments to together think about what policy should look like. Um, that's great. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you chief, because I think that's a very fancy title as well. The commissioner is good, uh, too. You were on this presidential task force. Talk more about what some of the main recommendations are, but then tie that back to this Constitution and the community program, because this is a form of community engagement that the task force recommended and that you're leading, and I want to know what you're going to teach these officers about the Constitution and how you're going to do it. Well, I mean, I had the honor of, of serving as co-chair of the task force. Tracy Mears was a, a member of the task force uh, as well. Um, we didn't have very much time to look at the issues, and, and there's a lot of complexity that we're trying to sort through now. Um, we were given 90 days, but that's the federal government way of counting 90 days. It was really like 57, I think, something like that, to have a report on the president's desk. So we decided to organize around six key areas that we call pillars. They were in no particular order with the exception of pillar number one, and that was building trust and legitimacy. Because without that, nothing else really matters, and everything kind of flows from that. So that's the way we organized our listening sessions, as we called it, uh, where people came and testified. I think we had like 120 people, and then we had another 150 or so submit written testimony. So within a short period of time, we got a pretty good feel for where people were coming from. And a lot of the recommendations and a lot of the, the testimony continued to touch on this whole notion of trust and legitimacy. I mean, obviously, training was part of it, policy, civilian oversight, uh, all these things were, were, were critical. But the one area that time and time again, and kind of was a constant theme through all the pillars, I think, was this whole notion of building trust and legitimacy and how police departments can go about doing that. And um, you know, one of the things, and, and it really kind of struck me when I was in Washington and I took a tour in 98 of the Holocaust Museum, and I never understood the role of police during that period of time. But when I went through and you look at the images there, it becomes very apparent police played a role. And the first thought I had was, you know, Germany had been a democracy. So how could officers who took an oath very similar to the one that I took become part of something like this? And so it led me to think about what is the role of police in a democratic society? And if you ask the average cop what their role is, they'll tell you law enforcement. Well, I would argue that the more important role is protecting the constitutional rights of all people. And that's where we've got to take the mindset of the men and women that serve. And if we did that, the rest of this stuff goes away because we look at everything differently. And so that's got to be the focus, and that's part of what we try to do here in the, in the, uh, in the center. 
when officers come. Help them better understand their role in society. We hire cops, their image of policing is just like a lot of people in this room right now, made from TV, from uh, movies, uh, you know, what they're seeing now on cable news, which is not all that positive. I mean, we draw experience from other places because we may not personally have that experience. And we've got to help people better understand, put it in the right context. And again, it is about protecting people's constitutional rights. Listen, it took me time to evolve. I've been in law enforcement 47 years. I didn't start off like that, <laughs> believe me. Uh, but I got there. And so I think all of us continue to grow and continue to evolve, but now we've got to pass that down to the men and women in our profession. But Tracy, I want you to respond as you think best, but please do touch on the police on the, on the chief's challenge. The main, what an astonishing thing he just said. The main job of a police officer in a democracy is to protect the Constitution. How do you teach police officers to do that? Yeah, I was going to respond exactly to that point, which, and by saying this, which is especially now in 2016, when we've undergone a fundamental change in policing in the last 30 years. Um, my law students don't actually realize this because most of them are under 30. But it's a relatively recent phenomenon that we understand the, a job, an important job, of the police to be about reducing crime. That wasn't true. I mean, yes, it's true the job of police was always to bring people who had broken the law to justice. But that's different from engaging in proactive strategies to reduce crime. And so this idea of police out on the street being warriors against crime over and above the idea of addressing folks and investigating individuals who have committed a crime has put a lot of pressure on the other job of police, which is to promote security of individuals. And one way you promote security is to make sure that individuals understand themselves to be safe from police overreach. Right? And one way you do that is about ensuring that agencies and those who work in them um, have commitments to constitutional ideals. So it's more important than ever in a world in which um, policing is about a certain vision of public safety, I think, to take heed of what um, Chief Ramsey was saying. Wow, okay, Barry, we now have our homework assignment, which is teaching police officers that their most important job is to respect the Constitution. You're, you teach this to law students, would you teach it to officers in the same way about Fourth Amendment doctrine, or how would you teach police officers to respect the Constitution? So this will be heresy here in the National Constitution Center, uh, and so I, I, I will commit heresy. Uh, I'll start on firm ground and move to heresy. So, you know, I teach uh, constitutional criminal procedure to law students, and it is based in the Constitution. And to echo something Tracy said, you know, the Fourth Amendment, which governs a lot of policing, and there's not a lot in the Constitution that governs policing because we didn't expect policing to look like it does today, but it refers to the right of the people to be secure in their persons and their effects from unreasonable searches and seizures. But I you know, I wouldn't teach police officers and I wouldn't talk with police agencies in only those constitutional terms. So I echo Commissioner Ramsey and I echo Tracy in terms of saying, and Sue Rar, who's a member of this ALI group and who runs training for police officers in Washington, she likes to refer to the guardian model of policing and, and, and in the lobby of her training facility it says, in these halls we train the guardians of democracy. And that's true, but I think one of the things we've gotten wrong with policing in this country is that we think about the Constitution as the main way to regulate policing, and as judges as the main way to regulate policing. And policing's complicated, and it's gotten extremely more complicated over the last few decades. And what we need to do is empower the police and the communities in which police operate to work together to have a set of best practices that are not the Constitution. The Constitution was always meant to be a rock bottom floor. You know, this you can't violate these rules, that's for sure, but it's not a guide to the best way to do things. And so there's a phrase that gets used in policing circles these days that, you know, sometimes practices are lawful but awful. And the question is, let's let's develop a good set of best practices about policing, which many, many departments already follow, but let's try to codify them and understand them and put them into action. And that's what I'd want to teach. What are some of those practices, just so we have a concrete sense of them? 
Yeah, you know, so I think one of those, for example, uh, you know, well, one very, very good example which we talked about today involves the use of force. So the Supreme Court has said very little about the use of force. And the main case, which is a case called Graham versus Connor, basically sets out a very general rule. It says when there's been an action that's challenged as excessive force, that we're going to look to see that the officer acted objectively under the totality of the circumstances. Now, that gives you almost no guidance. And I'll point out that it's just a, it's a backward-looking blaming rule. That's what it's there for. It's for cleaning up things that have gone wrong. But if we want to be admirable and think about what's the best way to avoid force being used, then we need to talk about a, training about a lot of other things, about teaching officers to use you know, verbalization to try to calm down events before they get to the point where force is being used. Uh, to have alternatives to deadly force. And again, you know, I mean, Commissioner Ramsey can speak to this best, but the best departments are already doing these things, and it's important just to make that the universal rule in the, in the United States. Tell us, uh, Chief, what the best departments are doing, what you did, and is Barry right that what we want to teach these recruits is not just constitutional rights, but constitutional values more broadly? Well, that, and you're, you're exactly right. It, it's not about using a constitution as a way to regulate police behavior. It's understanding the ideals and the principles behind our democracy and how, and, 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 and how that does evolve and change. I mean, what's happening right now in policing is just another step in the evolution of policing in this country, that one day people will look back at this as a moment, a defining moment in, in the history of policing in the United States. But very little time, if any, in the average police academy is spent talking about that sort of thing. Now we talk about the First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, and all that, and it's the do's and the don'ts, okay? It's the do's and the don'ts. It's not about the principles and the ideals behind it. Why is that so important? And that affects you as a person and your family, not just those people that you're out there serving or trying to arrest. And it's also important, I think, that how we view ourselves influences how we behave. And I'll give you an example. There's a metaphor that probably everybody has heard, and that is the police are a thin blue line. I assume that means we're standing between good and evil and all those kinds of things, right? And I don't, I don't buy into that anymore because I see the role of police as not being something that's separate and apart from the communities that we serve, but more of a thread that's woven throughout the communities that we serve that really helps hold together, hold together the very fabric of democracy as well as the fabric of that community. That's how important a role of police is in our society. And we have to see ourselves that way. When we unravel, democracy unravels. And, and, and if, we don't, if we don't understand the importance of our role and, and, and everything that we do, everything that we say, then guess what? Nothing's going to change. And we have to start somewhere. And why not start with understanding our role in the society that we happen to live in, the importance of our role. I mean, and we are key players in this uh, democracy of ours. I mean, this is exciting because we're actually uh, developing a curriculum. Tracy, can you help us develop it, and what should it contain? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Constitutional well, values that the office Another job. Know. Another job. You know, um, so. I was so impressed by, I mean, I was thinking that, you know, you have the best advisor right here. I, I, I'll, happy, I'll happily take notes about what um, Chief Ramsey says. That, that, that'll be my job. Um, but one of the things I think that's really interesting, just following from, you know, your journey from the Holocaust Museum to uh, the National Constitution Center, um, Sean Smoot and I, Sean Smoot is also another member of the President's Task Force on 21st century policing, and he held a, a conference sponsored by Southern Illinois University Schools of Medicine and Law at the Abraham Lincoln Museum in Springfield. And so we started talking about the programs that you've been running here at the National Constitution Center and the ones that had taken place at, at the Holocaust Museum, and, and I started to think it would be really neat to do something like that at the Abraham Lincoln Museum because of you know, his role um, in the Civil War and the Reconstruction Amendments and so on. Um, but you know, when you're thinking about curriculum, I think it's important that these kinds, this kind of teaching 
takes place in a, in a place like this, that it's not just the substance, but there's architectural significance to um, like the architecture of the curriculum, I mean, is itself an educative, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We've been talking all day. Uh, the, uh, the, you know, the structure it's, is itself educative, that it, that it takes place here. And so, you know, when you're thinking about ideas of the curriculum, I thought, well, you know, maybe it would be civil rights museums, you know, I'm not sure. But what I am sure is that doing things in the National Constitution Center and in places like the Abraham Lincoln Museum, that, that sounds right to me. And it's easy to get immersed in the whole topic and, and the whole feeling of this thing when you're in an environment like that, whether it's the Constitution Center, the Holocaust Museum, the Civil Rights Museum down in Atlanta, the Lincoln, uh, as opposed to a police academy. I mean, the, I mean, it's a world of difference. <laughs> and these things and these principles have to be woven throughout the curriculum not just a class that's a four hour block on somebody's schedule uh, and it's part of an overarching 780 hours that, you're, that you have to give. I mean, you know, it needs to be woven throughout and it needs to be constantly reinforced because recruits are one thing, veteran cops that have been exposed to a lot of stuff out here is a whole different ball game and we need to really constantly reinforce those values and not think it's a one time thing and they're good for the next 20, 30 years. It doesn't work that way. I was just gonna say something to that, which is that there is a nobility to places like this, and there's a nobility to policing, but it's also a difficult job. And when you're dealing with, you know, on the street all day long, it's easy to forget the nobility of it and to deal with the immediate problems in front of your face. I'll also just, um, you know, I'll echo Tracy that uh, Commissioner Ramsey is perfectly eloquent on the subject of democratic policing, and I've, I've learned a lot listening to him. And, you know, one of the things that I think is part of that that you want policing officials and officers to understand is the importance of the kind of transparency that we're seeing from leaders in policing today. And you know, I think policing has, there are plenty of folks in policing who haven't felt that same urge to transparency, and yet it, that's how you communicate with people, by kind of opening up, letting them see the problems, letting them see what it is that you're grappling with, and sharing that burden instead of feeling that you have to take the burden on all by yourself. Um, we have such spectacular questions from the audience, but I need just to have one round on how this project of constitutional education has changed post-Ferguson and post-body cams when so many police encounters are recorded. I mean, obviously restoring trust is all the more difficult. There have been so many incidents that have taken place since the task force issued its report. How does that fit into this educative Well, experience? first of all, I think we ought to recognize there will always be some incident that takes place that's not gonna be the way you'd like to see it. Yeah, I mean, I spent 17 years as a police chief, and I'm telling you, uh, I, it's just absolutely amazing. You, you, when people walk in your office, you can look at their face, <laughs> and you know uh, you're about to have a bad day. So, uh, <laughs> so I mean, there, there's always, it, it, but, but let me kinda get back. Some, it takes a crisis sometimes in order for things to move, because I think it's just human nature for people to kinda get comfortable you know, think that everything is going good, and then they see themselves and they see their role as just kind of guiding the ship, ship through calm waters, right? And then when that storm pops up, then you wind up with everybody kind of scrambling on the deck trying to get things uh, together. And so we can't lose that sense of urgency because the, I guarantee you there'll be another case. And when we talk about things like transparency, we need to have a real understanding with the public as to what that means because it means different things to different people. And we will never be totally transparent. We do have criminal cases that we're trying to put together that we cannot release certain information. And so we need to have those kinds of conversations up front as to what's realistic. And then we have to be very consistent in terms of how we then get that information out to the public. It's the not knowing that creates right. most of the tension. Yep. Uh, when we when we see these things, it's just not knowing and no one willing to speak, and 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 so forth. And we need to do that up front, not in a time of crisis, uh, because there will unfortunately there will always be something that will take place somewhere. And in today's world, it doesn't matter where it happens; it still impacts you, um, because it's the world we live in. We are connected, whether we want to be or not. Wow, okay, these are so many good questions. I'm gonna jump right in and I'll put some of them together. The first two are about trust. On the issue of trust, what is the reaction of people in less crime-ridden neighborhoods when someone says, 
at a party, for example, I am a cop, and the second question is, trust cannot be given without both parties listening to the experience of the other. It sounds like a truth and reconciliation commission, like they did in Greensboro, would be a good way to start building that trust. Your opinion, Tracy, you are the world expert on trust and legitimacy. How do you, <laughs> how do, you do it? Um, with respect to the first question, um, I, you know, I think we can make some assumptions about the extent to which someone who lives in a low crime um, area, whether they may or may not be more likely to trust the police, and that often has to do with the fact that they have fewer contacts with the police and fewer reasons to call police and are less likely to be disappointed, you know, when you don't have to call. I mean, we know that communities that um, are high demand for police services tend to be the communities that have lower levels of trust and often are communities of color in, in, urban, in urban areas. But the research is clear that no matter the demographic group, they all care about the same thing. They all care about being treated with dignity and respect, having voice, fair decision making, and, and motive-based trust, which gets to the how do you get there. The truth and reconciliation idea is, is interesting. Um, again, the research shows that acknowledgement of past wrongdoing is critical and important. And just a quick story, um, some of you may know about the incident in which uh, the former, I think he was the chief of police of Montgomery of Alabama, Montgomery of mm -hmm. Alabama. It was gave his badge to John Lewis um, spontaneously and said, you know, this was a, the chief wasn't even born when John Lewis um, was active in the civil rights era and, and had crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge, but he, this chief made a point, his name, last name is Murphy, of saying, you know, my, uh, the, the police agency at that time that I now represent did not act in a constitutional matter. This badge is a sign of upholding constitutional rights. And because you did, and the people you were with acted in that way, I want you to have this badge. That was a reconciliation moment. Um, you know, the question is how you can do those kinds of things at scale. Um, I don't know about the, the Greensboro uh, process, but I can imagine the way in which there could be um, great wisdom in that. Great. Can I real quickly Please. just add one, one thing uh, in terms of people who live in low crime areas, you know, that uh, don't have a lot of contact with police. Uh, and this is just a personal opinion. I don't know if there's any research or polls or anything that would, that would back this up. I think one of, the, one of the things that we need as police to pay real close attention to in this current environment and that is due to video. We always had a population of people that always were willing to give us the benefit of the doubt. Oh, cops have a tough job. Oh, yeah, you're in a high crime area, blah, blah, blah. And they give you the benefit of the doubt because they weren't personally witnessing this stuff. You see some of these cases on nightly news over and over and over again, and we're losing those folks because it's hard to deny that there are some things that go on that just aren't right, just flat out are not right. And so we've got to not only build trust in the more challenged neighborhoods, we've got to regain the trust amongst the population that has historically given us that benefit of the doubt because their, their faith in us is, be, is beginning to get a little shaken. And it's understandable, but I think we need to not ignore them as a population we need to really make sure we address. And I just want to underscore that, which is to say, you know, part of the reason that you get this sort of difference in opinions before there's the video is because it's very easy for society to say, well, we want to be safe, and we, we're not going to worry too much about what's going to make us safe, just make us safe. And you know, one of the things that I think, you know, there's been a lot of finger pointing at the police, but I'm very inclined to, to finger point at society and say, you have to take responsibility for policing. Exactly you can't right. just yeah. say the police are going to do this. OK, here is a, what may be a Fourth Amendment question. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'll throw it to you, Barry. Uh, and there are two of them, and they're complicated. So here, here we go. Or maybe it's a question about the All Writs Act. The first is, do you think local police will have capacity to unlock smartphones with warrants? Should they? Will courts be able to enforce to force people to unlock electronics and penalize those who refuse? One great question. And a related one, if that's not enough, 
Under what circumstances, if any, should law enforcement be able to get a court order to force a corporation such as Apple or Microsoft to divulge personal communications, including the creation of a backdoor to defeat encryption? What are the countervailing privacy considerations? <laughs> this sounds like an essay spotter on a law school exam, but it's a crucial question. It's one of the central so questions of our time. We did, do, we did a wonderful podcast on this two weeks ago with the two, uh, two of the guys who filed briefs on opposite sides of the Apple case. If you're not subscribing to the We the People podcast on iTunes, please do. They're phenomenal. It was a great discussion. But Barry, why don't you, know, you give your first take on whether there should be uh, backdoor uh, access to this data? I'd like to answer, but it is my exam this year. And so if I answer <laughs> it, no, The uh, students are, <laughs> should be listening to the, to the tape then. Uh, uh, you know, the policing project that I'm running <laughs> We almost filed our first brief in this in this round of the litigation, which has now uh, gone away because it turns out there is a way to unlock the iPhones. Uh, and, and now, in fact, it's it's Apple that wants to know how that happened. Uh, <laughs> but but you know, I have a very simple answer to that question, which is that I do think that policing agencies need to be able, with a warrant from a judge, to get certain information. But the thing that has gone wrong is Congress, which is I you know what. This is a little technical, but it's interesting, which is that the uh, Justice Department, the FBI, has wanted to get this permission from a judge under something called the All Writs Act. And the All Writs Act is a very old statute from the beginning of the Republic that basically says judges can issue the orders that they need to to get things done. But it can't mean that judges can just issue any order to anyone to do anything. There has to be some authority for what has to happen. And what's gone wrong in the country, I mean, I, I'm sorry that I keep beating the same drum, but it's an important drum is that Congress has not been able to step up to its responsibilities to decide on issues like encryption. And so these issues have been locked up in Congress, frozen, and that's why you know, the FBI is having to use the All Writs Act. If Congress did its job, we'd have a statute that said when there's access to this information or not, what the tech companies have to do. We have statutes like that. There's a statute on the books now that the acronym is CALEA about assistance to law enforcement, and it requires communications companies provide this sort of assistance to law enforcement. But Apple isn't a communications company, and Congress can't get itself you know, around to deciding what other companies have to do this sort of thing. And so yet again, a lot of what goes on in, in policing is just a failure of democracy. Fascinating. Chief, I, I can't resist asking, is this an important authority for the police to have in ordinary cases, or is this a really unusual? It is, it is important, uh, in my opinion, with a lawful court order that they be able to have access to these encrypted devices. It's not just about terrorism, child pornography. There are a lot of crimes now that are, that are captured on um, you know, uh, these kinds of devices. And you've only got so many tries to get at it or the evidence is wiped out. And so that's another challenge. You just can't keep toying around with it hoping you get the right combination. Um, it's probably true on your own phone. It, you've got you know, five or six tries and after that, it, it, you know, you got to get it unlocked uh, some other way. But, you know, I think it's important. But again, I think it needs to be with a lawful court order. Uh, it shouldn't just be a fishing expedition. But I think that it is important that we be able to have access. This whole issue of going dark is a very real issue. And they may have been able to hack into that one phone. Guarantee you there'll be somebody now that'll, that'll take a look and they will plug whatever hole uh, was there. And, they'll, and it'll be the same problem all over again at some point in time. We've got to come to an agreement under what circumstances can police or law enforcement have access to that kind of information, provided, of course, they've convinced a, uh, a court to provide them with a warrant. I can't resist asking, Tracy, any disagreement? When it, you know, of course, I channel this question as I do all uh, privacy questions, WWBD, what would Brandeis do? <laughs> and in his great wiretapping descent, Brandeis thought that very intrusive wiretaps for low-level crimes that revealed a lot of innocent information might be unreasonable even with a warrant. Do you think there are some circumstances under which this backdoor would be unreasonable even with a warrant? I, I, want, I am going to kind of punt, but I was incredibly impressed by um, the way that Barry answered the question. <laughs> Um, as, as was I, of course. Which is I pay her for this on occasion. <laughs> no, it was but, masterful, really. <laughs> I think in, in the following sense that do I think, well, yeah, I could imagine that I would think that, right? But the point is, which gets back to, you know, gets me back on firm ground on you know, procedural justice and legitimacy, which is, it's the important thing is that we have a process 
for figuring out when that's appropriate. And one of our processes for doing this is the legislative process that's failing, right? And so um, I can have my opinion and others can have their opinions and we can um, you know, contact our Congress people and hopefully they can do their job, but the, it's not working that way. And so if we're in a situation where we're talking about what would Brandeis do, I think in some sense that's a failure. Uh, great. Uh, he was very keen on the states, especially as laboratories of democracy and would have supported efforts by local legislatures to, to regulate this stuff. Uh, to Commissioner okay. Ramsey, instead of protecting people's constitutional rights, which police may find to encompass, uh, uh, might we insist, sorry, this is my constitutional reading glasses are failing, not the, the question itself. <laughs> he, he said, might we insist, uh, ch charge them with creating and preserving civil order that way we have a role creating order in addition to enforcement. Order must allow civil disobedience but not violence. Well, that's part of the mission of, of police too. I mean, I, when I said that, I didn't mean that's the only thing. I mean, you know, uh, policing is a very complex profession and there are a lot of things we need to do. Uh, my whole point was that in the mix, you know, this whole issue of protecting people's rights needs to be a big part of it and understanding what that means as we go about doing our daily duties. But we still have a, we have a responsibility to, to uh, uh, enforce laws, to prevent crime, to maintain order. I mean, all those things are, are part of the mission of policing. And so I don't disagree with you. It's just not an either-or proposition. I mean, there's a whole lot of ingredients in the pot. Is, is that a constitutional value as well, pres pre uh, preserving a more perfect union? Yeah, I mean, you know, and it is a more, they say, it's a, what did the president say, is more perfect union because it's never gonna be probably perfect. In fact, we call it policing in a more perfect union, mm -hmm. uh, which again, kind of gives you the sense of evolution and evolving that, that constantly is going on. So yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a complex job and it's getting more and more complex as time goes on. Uh, Tracy, what weight, if any, is placed on dismantling the personal biases of law enforcement officers? What weight? I mean, I, I think, why am I hesitating? I'm hesitating because the question states specifically what uh, about dismantling the personal biases. Um, and so I guess the best kind of pointy-headed way of answering that question is that if we're talking about biases, dismantling them is impossible. Right? We're, we're not going to erase bias. Um, the, the social psychology of, of bias is, is clear. We all have biases. What you can do is make them more salient to people. Um, you can make yourself aware of them. You can figure out ways of uh, encouraging people to act in ways that will diffuse or make less consequential their biases. But, you know, biases exist because of the structure of society. And so one way of answering that is to say, what weight should we place? We as a society should place great weight uh, on that. But to think that that is the job of police and policing agencies is looking at the problem in the wrong way. Uh, Barry, should stop and frisk be abolished? Well, that's a hard question. Uh, so, you know, I was just teaching this, and we sort of work through, you know, what the Constitution has to say about this sort of thing, and it talks about probable cause, which stop and frisk doesn't require. We get to the end of the whole discussion, and I ask the students, so, you know, what should we do about stop and frisk? And uh, the one thing that everybody notices, and that I think it's safe to say is that you know the, the Supreme Court had its main stop and frisk case in 1968, in a case called Terry versus Ohio, and that case was a case about an officer patrolling uh, the streets uh, in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, observed somebody, a couple of guys who look like they're casing a joint, and he eventually follows them, and it turns out that they've got guns. Uh, and he arrests them, and, the, and the, the, the Supreme Court's in a tough spot because it's not clear that there's probable cause that they were going to do something wrong, but they definitely, but the police officer stopping and frisking was definitely a search or seizure that the Constitution governs, and so it's in this gray space, what do you do, and the Supreme Court said yes, it's fine. But that's, you know, since then, stop and frisk evolved dramatically. 
Nothing in Terry versus Ohio would have had you think that you know hundreds of thousands of people would be stopped and frisked a year. And I, you know, my answer is law enforcement consistently has said we have a need for this device. To the extent that that is true, and I am inclined to believe that it is true, the question is how do you cabinet? How do you restrict it to the times of true necessity? I mean, in New York, the numbers have dropped under the current leadership from hundreds and thousands of stop and frisks to tens of thousands, less. And the city no, you know, no more dangerous, no less safe. And I think the one thing that you can say for sure is that you need to require officers, if they're going to stop and frisk, to be able to say what's the crime that they think is being committed. And that, that alone would make an enormous difference. Um, uh, com uh, Commissioner, uh, best way for building trust and legitimacy, is that by having the police force reflect the racial makeup of the community? No, not necessarily, not, not by itself. I, I believe in diversity. I was chief of police in Washington, D.C., which is a majority African-American uh, department, some 63% of the officers, even though African-Americans make up uh, about 50% of the population. I had just as many complaints in D.C. as I get here. That's not by itself going to magically solve the problem. Uh, now, we need to be a diverse workforce, so don't get me wrong. But to think that there's something that easy that can be done that's going to all just, just suddenly change everything, I, I think it's just not uh, realistic. We need officers uh, who care about the community, and the majority of them do, that make personal contact with people. I think you build trust one person at a time, one cop at a time. That's how you do it. I mean, you know, we got to be out there. We got to walk in neighborhoods. We got to see people when they're not in a state of crisis and you get out of the cars, you know, and really learn the neighborhood. I mean, in Philly, all of our recruits start on foot patrol in some of our most challenged neighborhoods. Why? They need to understand there's more decent law abiding people living in that community than there are criminals. You know, they want the same thing you want. They want to be able to send their kids to a decent school, but guess what? They're trapped in an environment where they know they got to send them to an inferior school. I mean, you've got a lot of issues here that you've got to be sensitive to and understand what people are going through. And we don't need to be that one thing that just adds one more burden on top of it. And when getting to know people and knowing them on a very personal level is how you do it. And then I don't care when people call 911. They don't say, send me a black cop or a white cop. They just say, send me a cop, because they need one. Beautiful. Um, I think I'm going to close by asking each of you this question. Uh, starting with Tracy, if there's one thing you want the police to know about the Constitution, what would it be? That is really interesting. You should have like given me a. Pro so we'll I start have it with somebody else, right? <laughs> no, no, I have an answer. Yeah. I totally have. Like something immediately came to mind, mm -hmm. um, but. You know, then I think about it longer, and then I think, no, but it should be this, it should be that. So I'm going to go with, with the first thing I thought of, um, and that is that, uh, like, <laughs> like Barry, I teach uh, constitutional criminal procedure. Um, I even have a casebook now. And um, one of the things that's really fascinating about the origin of constitutional criminal procedure is that, you know, many people think of criminal procedure as tied up in war and court decisions um, from the 60s, but criminal procedure actually has a longer history. I mean, going way back, but, um, you know, some of the earliest, most robust cases were decided in the, the 30s um, around again, a, a, a series of, of cases involving um, criminal justice processing, primarily of African-American defendants in the South. So I'm thinking of the Scottsboro Boys cases or um, the first case in which the Supreme Court actually uh, reviewed um, police action, Brown versus Mississippi, as the coerced confession. And what was fascinating about those cases is that the court tried to articulate um, ideas of fundamental fairness that came out of its interpretation of the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. And so I guess the thing I would want them to understand is something about fundamental fairness and the ways in which the values underlying, at least how the court understood that term, 
I think, reflect the ideas and the values that we've been talking about today. You know, very lofty ideas about, you know, how we understand ordered liberty and our commitments to democracy um, and the role of law and law enforcement in, in pursuing those, um, those ideals. And, you know, I think one could have a really interesting conversation about fundamental fairness in a building like this. That's so great. I'm so glad I asked. Um, Barry, you've had a little more time to think about it. What's the one thing that I you was, would like to please glad to that I was second about for the that Constitution. Question. Actually, I, I had I have an answer, but I, th that immediately occurred to me. You know, I said earlier, Jeff, that it was heresy to talk. You know, you asked how should we regulate policing, and I said don't think about the Constitution. We need to think about Congress and about statutes. But it's actually not heresy because everybody, when they think about policing in particular, they think about the Bill of Rights. You know, we want to teach police officers about the Equal Protection Clause and equality. We want to teach police officers about the rules about search and seizure and the Fourth Amendment or interrogation and the Fifth Amendment. But it's so easy to forget that the sort of first principle of the Constitution is that we are a, a participatory democracy and that everything we do in this democracy has to involve the people. And I want to emphasize that when I say the people, I include the police. So Sir Robert Peel, who was sort of the inventor of modern policing, said, you know, the people are the police and the police are the people. We're all used to hearing this, uh, those who do this all the time. But it's so essential not to forget this, that we all have to come together and decide what we want policing to look like. And if we can't do that, then we're, we're just giving up on our most fundamental responsibilities. So it's democracy. That's great. Chief, before I give you the last word, I want to thank you for this incredible initiative. The National Constitution Center is doing many, many exciting, inspiring uh, projects for constitutional education, but the idea of educating our police officers about the Constitution is surely among the most important, and I want all of you to follow this initiative and make suggestions for expanding it and get involved and, and help us really bring the Constitution to every officer in America. Uh, Chief Ramsey, last word to you. You're teaching officers about many aspects of the Constitution, if you had to pick just one, what would it be? Well, I mean, I'm not a law professor, so I can't get into a whole lot of uh, detail around it, but here's what I would like people to really understand. Since our country was founded, and this is a perfect, I mean, right here in the city of Philadelphia, millions of people have died defending our democracy. And we owe it to them, the dead, and also the living, to uphold the ideals and the principles of democracy that makes this country as great as it is. And police play a key role in that. And if they don't leave with anything else, then they ought to leave with that kind of respect, that kind of deep respect for the principles and the values that you find in our democracy and in the Constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Barry Tracy and the great Chief Ramsey.